Hello, everyone. Uh, good morning here in the Philippines. Uh, good evening in uh, North America. Welcome. I'm Jet Aguilar from the Astronomical League of the Philippines, and I will be hosting uh, today's webinar. Thank you so much for joining us for our 2023 Astronomy Experts Speaker Series online lectures. We are so fortunate to have with us today as our speaker, none other than the director of the U.S. National Solar Observatory at Boulder, Colorado, in the United States. We are currently at solar maximum or solar cycle 25, or at a period of heightened solar activity, wherein our sun exhibits a lot of visible sunspots, solar flares, prominences, and here, even geomagnetic storms. The Astronomical League of the Philippines is very happy and honored to present an online lecture by Dr. Valentin Martinez Pilet on the topic, New Windows to the Sun, the Daniel K. Inuye Solar Telescope and its companions. My fellow ALP member, Mr. Edwin Aguirre, will be doing the introduction for our esteemed speaker later. For those who are not able to register, but would still want to watch this ongoing webinar, we are currently live streaming on Facebook at the Facebook page of the Philippine Astronomy Forum. Before we start, kindly allow me to explain some rules for this webinar to help make this an enjoyable learning experience for all. Please listen and do your best to give your undivided attention to our speaker. There will be a short question and answer session at the end of the lecture. You may type in your questions under the Q&A tab found in your Zoom interface at any point during the presentation. We will do our best to read and answer your questions live after the lecture or via the Q&A tab. We would like to remind everyone that the contents presented in this webinar will remain as the individual property of the lecturer and the photographers in the presentation. We will also be distributing certificates of attendance via email to all registered, registered attendees who will be present with us throughout the webinar. So please use the name you have written in your registration forms to help us facilitate this process. So let us all enjoy the webinar and have fun learning. Here is the program flow for our webinar. I would like to turn you over now to Mr. James Kevin T., the President of the Astronomical League of the Philippines, to give his welcome remarks. Uh, good morning to all our viewers in the Philippines and uh, good evening to our guests in the United States and Europe. Uh, my name is James Kevin T., President of the Astronomical League of the Philippines, and on behalf of ALP, I would like to welcome you to our Astronomy Experts Speaker Series 2023. Uh, this webinar is part of the ALP's International Astronomy Outreach Program. Our goal is to bring renowned science, uh, scientist experts to the Filipino people and to the rest of the world. That is why this webinar is uh, being offered free to the general public. I would like to take this opportunity to thank ALP members, especially uh, Dr. Jet Aguilar, uh, Edwin Aguirre, uh, Jun Lau, Kendrick Colty, Andrew Ayn-Chan, Peter Tobalinal, Eric Africa, and Justin Chan. So this will be our 20th lecture in our speaker series. Our speaker for today is no other than Dr. Valentin Pillay, Martinez Pillay, a solar physicist and a current director of the U.S. National Solar Observatory in Boulder, Colorado. We have more distinguished lecturers lined up in the coming months, so please Stay tuned uh, and please do not forget to register in advance to our future webinars. Thank you very much. And I would like to turn the, over the program to Edwin Aguirre, who will introduce our speaker for today. Hi, everyone. Um, it gives me a distinct honor and pleasure to introduce our uh, special guest for tonight. Uh, no other than uh, Dr. Valentin Martinez Pilet. As uh, my colleagues had mentioned earlier, uh, Dr. Pilet is the director of the U.S. National Solar Observatory in Boulder, Colorado. He is also a former professor and senior scientist 
at the Instituto de Astrofisica de Canarias in Spain. And uh, he is the past president of the International Astronomical Union's Division Two, the Sun and the Heliosphere, and Commission 12, Solar Radiation and Structure. Dr. Pilet was the lead scientist for the Imaging Magnetograph Experiment, IMAX, aboard the Sunrise Balloon Born Solar Observatory and was a co-principal investigator of the Solar Orbiter, Polarimetric and Helioseismic Imager for the European Space Agency's Solar Orbiter Mission. So uh, please welcome uh, Dr. Martinez Pilet for our, our webinar on the sun. Thank you so much. Thank you all. I am going to start sharing my screen. Uh, do you see my slides? Yes. Yes, doctor. Yeah. Good. Okay, well, before I start, I really want to thank the Astronomical League of the Philippines for this opportunity to bring the sun uh, to this audience. I've been watching some of these Astronomy Expert series, and I think it really is a crash course in modern astrophysics. Uh, I promise that I'll be watching them all. It's really interesting. And I'm honored to be able to bring the dedicated solar uh, talk for this, this Astronomy Expert series. So what I'm going to be talking, as the title of my talk indicates, is about the Daniel K. Inoue Solar Telescope. This is a telescope uh, that the National Solar Observatory is operating on the island of Maui. I'll be also talking about some of its companions, mostly uh, space missions. But really, this will be the last part of my presentation. The first part of my presentation is going to be about telling why the sun is important, why we need to study the sun, and putting the sun in the context of today's astrophysics and why why we're doing the Air Force that you are going to see, like building a four meter solar telescope and pointing it to the sun. So let me start with this slide here on the left. You have a standard image of the sun. And as I say here, you know, there's really nothing special about the sun. If you think about the mass of the sun is very standard. There are many many stars in our galaxy, millions, that are of a similar mass. There are many stars that are of the similar radius. The sun is in what we call the main sequence, is burning hydrogen, producing helium. It's a very common star. There is nothing special about the sun other than it is our star. It is the star that the Earth is orbiting, and from, we, from where we get all the energy, and most of the energy that we use on a daily basis here on, on planet Earth. Now, there is a misconception about the sun, which is that the sun is only this yellow ball that during the day is up in the sky, in the night is underneath us, illuminating the other side of the earth. But it's just this yellow high density ball that you see in this image. What I want to emphasize here in my presentation is actually that the sun has an expanding and an extended atmosphere that goes way beyond all the planets in the solar system. It actually goes past Pluto. And this is an extended atmosphere that we call the heliosphere. And the heliosphere is all dominated by the sun, is all dominated by things that are starting on this yellow high density inner core of the heliosphere, the, 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 what we call uh, the, the, the sun most of the time. But the sun extends for these 100 astronomical units and it goes into this area where all the planets are orbiting. So this is an artist impression. This is not real data, what we have in here in this, in this animation. And you see that there is this atmosphere of the sun that is expanding. Actually, that's what we call the solar wind. Nothing special about the solar wind. All stars have some form of stellar winds. And these stellar winds are creating the physical conditions inside the heliosphere. Then it goes all the way to these 100 astronomical units, typically. And then it encounters what it is here, this yellow part, this, sorry, uh, the green part, which is the plasma in the galaxy. The plasma in the galaxy has different properties. And when the plasma from the galaxy and the plasma from the sun meet, they encounter at this boundary uh, that is of bright green color over here. We call it the heliopause. 
This is really where the sun ends and then it enters into the galaxy. The Voyager spacecraft have just crossed that boundary. It's called the Heliopause. Uh, and we are now uh, starting to measure outside of the solar system for the first time, thanks to the Voyager um, spacecraft. But the sun is as big as 100 astronomical units, and the sun really influences everything that is in this plasma blob that you can see over here. If there is something that I want to make clear during my presentation is what does it mean, this statement that I have in here? This phrase, we live inside the extended atmosphere of an active star, is something that I heard first as part of the Living with a Star program of NASA. And I think it beautifully represents everything that I want to tell here. But I will have to emphasize different aspects of this statement. I'm here putting in boldface what I'm going to be talking in my talk. I want to emphasize this part of the we live. We are in actually inside this extended atmosphere. And the extended atmosphere is what I was referring to, the heliosphere. And it is an active star. It's a star that is not always the same. It changes over time. And already here in this image, you probably are recognizing what we call sunspots. Sunspots are sometimes there, and today the sun has sunspots, but sometimes there are no sunspots on the sun because this is an activity cycle that comes and goes. And here you have an image of where we are with the current activity cycle. This is cycle 25. We've done all of this. This is the ascending part of the solar cycle. And once we've seen already the solar minimum, the previous solar minimum that did occur in 2020. We've seen this ascending phase, even the inflection point. We now have a clear understanding that the cycle 25 is going to be a little stronger than the previous one, the cycle 24, but it's going to be significantly less strong than the previous one, the uh, cycle 23. So it's going to be somewhere in between, closer to cycle 24 than cycle 25. Uh, and this is mostly because we've been already observing the sun as it, go, it is going through the solar maximum. Solar maximum will actually occur next year. So this is a very regular cycle that occurs every 11 years. And we've been monitoring this for actually centuries. Here you have a historical record of this up and, and down. The yellow curve is the number of sunspots that has been measured well today with modern telescopes. But in the past, it was drawings. Uh, never, ever look at the sun directly. But there are ways to project the sun and actually count sunspot. And this is something that astronomers have been doing for uh, centuries, as you can see here. One, one thing that I want to point out is that we know that in the 17th century, there was this period where there were no sunspot. It's called the Maunder Minimum for reasons we don't understand. The sun stopped producing sunspot with the same regularity that it does when we see the 11 year solar cycle. One thing that it is important to keep in mind is that the 11 year solar cycle is probably produced by regular flows that are occurring inside the sun. But if these flows are perturbed, probably there is a way in which we can stop the cycle for, from occurring. And this is probably the reason why there was a Maunder minimum. We've seen similar Maunder minimum in other stars. And we don't know when is this gonna happen on the sun. Right now, as you can tell, we have had three centuries of regular 11 year solar cycle and as I said, we are approaching cycle, the maximum of cycle 25. This image that you have in here is kind of equivalent to the image that I just shown before, uh, the yellow ball, uh, this high density plasma ball that I was talking about. Uh, but here we're observing the sun in ultraviolet. These are wavelengths that you need to go outside of the Earth's atmosphere to start seeing them. And what you see here in bright, here, this region over here, I hope you can see my, my cursor, this, this one in here, or even this here, what you will have at the foot point is a sunspot. So this is how you see sunspots in the ultraviolet. So actually they are very bright. Uh, and I'll get to why they are bright, uh, but what I like to emphasize here is that sunspots are not a surface phenomenon. As you can see, it's a 3D structure. Uh, there is a sunspot here, and then it goes into all these regions over here. What is what we're observing here? This is what we call the solar corona. And I'm gonna to refer to the solar corona multiple times in my talk. What I wanna say is that actually this is the first part of this extensive, atmo extensive atmosphere that I was talking about before where we are orbiting, the extended atmosphere of the sun. Uh, this is the sun observed in ultraviolet. 
And here I am comparing the sun during solar minimum and during solar maximum. On the left is solar minimum and on the right is solar maximum. Again, is ultraviolet wavelengths. Uh, it's actually 195 angstroms. Uh, and this is two solar cycles ago. And what you can see is that during solar minimum, you know, the sun doesn't have as many brightenings as during solar maximum. It's not as active. It's not as dynamic, but there are still things going on. So it's not that it is totally quiet with nothing happening. Uh, you will still have brightening things coming and uh, uh, emerging from the surface. Uh, you see local brightening, they fade away, uh, but not as much and not as bright as during solar maximum. But during solar minimum, there is all this activity that is still occurring. And what I wanna say here is that if you see things that are of interest here, if you are looking at things that get your attention, all of them, all of them are of magnetic origin. Everything that you see here that is of interest is due to the solar magnetic fields. It's all, as I said here, about solar magnetism. How do we know that the sun has magnetic fields? Well, that was found in 1908 by George Hale at the observatory in California at Mount Wilson. And here you have uh, George Hale with his uh, spectrograph. What he did is do a spectroscopy of sunspot. I'm not gonna enter into many details about what a spectroscopy is. Those that have followed the series, the spectroscopy has come multiple times. Is how we find velocities, how we find physical properties of all astronomical objects also on the sun. So what Hale did was to put a slit and you need to put is this thin black line over here to put a slit on top of a sunspot. And when he did that, he saw that this spectral line, a spectral line is an atom that is on the sun that is absorbing a specific color. When you do a spectroscopy, you are dispersing the colors, but if there is an atom that is observing a specific color, you'll see an absorption. You'll see this dark feature over here. And here we see on this green part, a number of uh, spectral lines. There is one very weak here. There is one of medium intensity and a very dark intensity. Very, very dark, intense spectral line here. Uh, so what Hale found was that this spectral line, uh, the one that is surrounded by the red circle, when it entered the sunspot, the sunspot can be recognized by these black features. Actually, one spectral line turned into three, and you see the three spectral lines here. Actually, 10 years ago, before George Hale observed that feature on the sunspot, Zeeman, in Europe found that that's what happens when an atom is on a magnetic field, that one single absorption or emission line gets split into three. And that's the Seaman splitting. And that's what Hale found. And he was aware of this discovery 10 years ago from uh, Zeeman. And then he was, it was very clear for him that this splitting, when it enters the sunspot, it indicates that there is a magnetic field on the sun. And we now know that there is a actually a magnetic field on the sun. And this is not a surprise. Actually, all astronomical objects have a magnetic field. Why? Because you have always charged particles moving. And when you have electrons, protons, or other charged particles moving around, you create magnetic fields. That's how magnetic fields are created. The Earth has a magnetic field. That's what tells us what the North is. I'm sure you all have played with uh, magnets. And here I have a magnet. I actually have two magnets with me that I'm going to use for in a second. Uh, and they do have a magnetic field. There are charges moving inside the magnets that create the magnetic fields. One property of the magnetic fields is that they do have a polarity. The magnetic fields comes out from one pole and comes into the magnet from the other pole, the north and south pole. That happens also on the sun. As I said, this brightening here in UV will have a sunspot at the foot point. And when you have here are magnetic field lines that are coming out and getting into the sun, probably one sunspot here, another sunspot here, and all the magnetic field lines that are extending in this 3D uh, volume that is the solar corona. So every time you have a sunspot over here, you'll have these yellow lines. The yellow lines, we call them close field lines because they close relatively close to the, uh, to the sun, to the surface of the sun. Uh, these are intense magnetic fields, but in the sun, there are also weak diffuse magnetic fields. And here they are represented by these red lines over here. These diffuse magnetic field lines will actually expand much further uh, from the surface than the yellow lines, 
we call them open field lines. And these are the ones that will create the heliosphere and all the plasma conditions in the heliosphere that will be carrying a big fraction of the solar wind. And this is the background heliosphere. But when there's an explosion, and you'll see that there are explosions on this type of configurations, it is then the explosions that dominate the heliosphere over the background created by the red line. I'll show you an example in a second. But I'm already talking about explosions. And for understanding the explosions, I want you to look at uh, the magnets that I have in here. These are two magnets. It has two poles. And I'm sure you've done this at a school and you've seen it all. Uh, but I think it's good that I remind you what happens with magnets because it's going to be important to understand uh, everything that I'm going to be saying next of what happens on the sun and actually also on the heliosphere and for planets. When you get to magnets, if you put them with opposite polarity, this is north and here north is down, here is up, and you bring them together, they connect, they get together. But if you do the same with the two magnets in parallel, now north is on both of them at the top, when you try to pull them together, they actually repel each other. So this, which is something we've learned at school, is actually very, very important to understand the dynamics on the sun. We're able to actually find maps of polarities of the magnets on the surface of the sun. Here you have an example. This example is taken by the Japanese satellite Hinode. And as you see, there are, there are whites and blacks. White and blacks are the two polarities, uh, the magnets on the sun, how they are moving around. What you see in there is about 12 hours of real time, and you see how much the magnets are moving on the sun. As I said, what is important is when the two polarities are together, whether they are parallel or antiparallel to each other. Antiparallel will be when you have the white, like here, and the black. When white and black are together, this is where the explosions can occur. This is where we need to be watching out. It is the configuration, the magnetic configuration that can lead to big explosions are when these two polarities get into contact. Areas like this one, where it's mostly white, will be not prone for explosions. But this one, where there is the black and the white together, are the ones that lead to explosions. So what we do is to actually monitor these black and whites over the solar surface. I got this magnetogram. Uh, that's how we call these uh, maps of the polarities on the sun. Uh, I got this, man, this magnetogram from our GONG network. This is actually the map of polarities of today on the sun. I took this. This was taken at uh, the GONG station on the Canary Islands, uh, and it's from today. So this is how the sun now is looking in terms of what are the maps of polarities. Of course, here with the Japanese satellite, we have much better resolution, much better sensitivity. Uh, the GONG network, it doesn't have the same level of resolution or sensitivities, but it does have always a network that is looking at the sun. So we monitor the sun here 24 seven with this gone network. And here we have one area where there is black and white. If I were to say, where is the most uh, likely region that can create an explosion on the sun? It would be near this area over here. There are others, but I think that's the one that I would uh, say, well, these are the one that is looking to me like more, more able to create an explosion. So, I'm talking about explosions. Let me show you examples of what explosions on the sun are. And here you have one case. This is very spectacular. Again, here we're observing with the NASA SDO satellite. Uh, this is the ultraviolet. So this is again the solar corona. And what you have is what we call a solar flare. The solar flare is the brightening, it's the really bright explosion. But on top of the bright explosion, the bright explosion happens now, you see all this material. This is a prominence, we call it. Uh, this is material from the sun. It's actually expelled from the, from the flare. In this case, the flare probably didn't have much energy and most of the mass came down and you see it's falling down back on the sun. But sometimes the sun does a much better job and is able to eject all this material. Here you have another prominence. This is material that is not falling because of the magnetic field, the magnetic configuration that the structure is suspending all this mass, and then the flare occurs and all the mass is ejected. Actually, these are called coronal mass ejection. I was talking about the uh, poles of the magnetic fields and that only when they get together is when we have these magnetic explosions. The magnetic explosion has occurred here along this line. 
Well, I can tell you that even without looking at it, I know that if the polarity here is white of the magnetic field here on this part is white, on the other part, on the other side, it's going to be black. It's going to be opposite polarities because it is then when uh, the filaments occur and when the explosions occur and when the coronal mass ejections occur. So you see all this mass, beautiful mass seen in the corona that is ejected. This is a coronal mass ejection. Where is all this mass going? Well, all this mass is now going into the heliosphere. And here there is a lot of information that I need to explain. Uh, there's a lot to unpack, so I'm going to take some time explaining what is what you see. We are observing the solar system from the North Pole, from above. And the, at the center, we have the sun. And this green over here is the Earth. You do see now this spiral. Uh, this spiral is called actually the Parker's spiral. This is these red field lines that I was talking. They are more diffuse. They are not as strong, and they create the heliosphere, which normally has this spiral configuration. But then every time the sun has one of these major explosions uh, and one of these coronal mass ejections, the spiral gets perturbed by the explosion itself and by the plasma in the coronal mass ejection that is distorting all this, all this configuration. Here you have one coronal mass ejection that actually hits the Earth. And then there was an active region on the other side of the sun has one, two, three coronal mass ejections. And then finally has a fourth one that is even stronger and faster is this black one here. That coronal mass ejection was measured by this satellite in here, STA. This is a stereo A. Stereo A was able to sense the strength of that black coronal mass ejection, and is by far the strongest coronal mass ejection ever measured in modern times. Uh, why was it so strong? Well, when you have three coronal mass ejections that occur before the one that comes later, the first three coronal mass ejections were able to clean up the space in the interplanetary medium to take all the particles there and clear it up. And then the fourth coronal mass ejection actually was expanding into vacuum mostly. And that's why it was able to have much higher speeds. So one thing that we've learned uh, over the last few years, over the last couple of decades, is that what is important is when, a, when an active region, when a sunspot region, start producing coronal mass ejections, after the first few coronal mass ejections, the next one are going to be faster because the first one clean up the space in between. And that's one of the problems that we can face here on the Earth when we have this successive coronal mass ejection. The next one is going to be much faster. The one that hit the Earth here in this data wasn't that important, but if this one, the black one, would have hit the Earth, we would have probably faced consequences that uh, we've never seen in modern times. I'll get back to how strong these uh, explosions on the sun can be and what the impact can be in a second. Uh, but this one, thankfully, it was in 2012, so did, did occur 10 years ago, didn't hit the Earth. And as I said, if we wouldn't hit the Earth, uh, we probably would have still uh, feeling some of the impacts of that coronal mass ejection. So why is uh, this important for the Earth and how is it that it would create this important effects in our society. Here you have a simulation. Again, this the previous one was data. The previous one was actually data that we have from satellite. This is just a animation, artistic animation, that is trying to explain how are they created. So you have two sunspots here with different polarities. And through an instability that we don't understand, you get a coronal mass ejection. The reasons behind the stability are not known. But what we know is that there is this blob of plasma that carries the material, the plasma, but also magnetic fields from the sun. So it has a direction. So here, and I'm going to stop it here, the plasma from the sun is pointing coming down. And this is material from the sun. And here we have the Earth. The Earth also has a magnetic field. And in the case of the Earth, the day side part of the Earth magnetic field is always pointing up. Here in this animation, the magnetic field from the sun is pointing down. And I already mentioned with my magnets how important it is whether they are coming parallel or anti-parallel because they react in totally different manics. If you remember, when they are opposite is when they connect. And you're going to see the connectivity here and what happens because of the connectivity. Just because it comes with opposite directions, they connect. And actually what happens is that then the Earth is connected to the solar plasma. And the solar plasma enters the Earth's atmosphere, and it creates the auroras, beautiful auroras. But of course, it does have other consequences. So here you have seen the process 
when the coronal mass ejection from the sun comes antiparallel to the magnetic field of the Earth. And it is then when we get the big solar storm that impact us and creates the auroras, as you can see here. What would have happened if the magnetic field from the sun would have been parallel? Well, it's, it would have probably, well, repel like the, mag like the magnets, it would have slipped each other and there would have been a minor geomagnetic storm, not one of the big ones. So now we know that we get big geomagnetic storm when there are sunspots, when the instabilities occur, when they have enough energy, it is important to see if there are other CMEs that have occurred before, because this one will then be faster if there were others prior to this one. And it's also important to know how the magnetic field of the CME is coming. Is it anti-parallel or parallel? It is all of this that is needed for the big geomagnetic storm to have a tremendous impact in our society. Yes, it produced beautiful auroras that we all want to see. And I've just seen the magnetic configuration of the Earth, how it all concentrates near the poles. That's why you need to go to the poles to see the auroras. But also in these areas, when you shake the magnetic field of the Earth, what you do is you induce currents. And where do currents flow? Currents flow where it's easier for them to flow, which is in the electrical power grid. And the electrical power grid always have currents. But if all of a sudden you bring additional currents created by the geomagnetic storm, what you produce is a short circuit. And actually you can have blackouts in cities. Here is a blackout that occurred in March 8, 1989 in the city of Quebec. Of course, the closer you are to the poles, the more impacts uh, you see from the magnetic storm. Quebec was without any light for nine hours. Uh, and that was a relatively large magnetic explosion, but there are even larger magnetic explosions that we know can occur. In our technological society, there are actually a number of effects that uh, can be impacted by this type of geomagnetic storm. Is the GPS communications. We now are used to have the GPS to go to places we don't know exactly what it is. Well, the GPS, the accuracy of the GPS is impacted by the geomagnetic storms. And perhaps it's not important for us to go to the cafeteria that we are trying to find where it is, but it is important for banking transactions that need precise timing and the GPS accuracy is important. There are a lot of technological aspects that are impacted by these geomagnetic storms when planes are going through polar routes. They might not be able to communicate. They might receive additional radiation, radiation that is uh, that can have important health effects on the pilots, on the uh, um, astronauts when they are doing outside work outside of the International Space Station, we try to give them warning for them to go inside and be protected from the radiation that is coming from the sun. It is thought that if uh, an important geomagnetic storm would have occurred, similar to the ones we know they did occur in the past, there would be trillion of dollars of losses, economic losses only in the US. How important can these uh, geomagnetic storms be? The one we know that was really important did occur in 1859, and it was uh, actually tracked by an astronomer, Richard Carrington, uh, in London. It was an astronomer that was always drawing the sunspot, and he drew this sunspot over here. This is the sunspot that actually had the flare, and we know it is this the sunspot because he was also here drawing these white regions on top of the spot. And this is what we call the white light flare. So he was even able to see the white light flare when he was doing the projections and the drawings. The flare did occur in September 1st, 1859. September 2nd, so a day later, we had auroras even at the latitude of Hawaii, which typically the auroras are seen in Canada. There were auroras seen in Mexico, in Venezuela, in Hawaii. So auroras were everywhere because it was a huge geomagnetic storm. A CME typically takes two, three days to arrive from the sun to the earth. This one arrived the earth in, I remember, if I remember what I think it was 18 hours, so less than a day. So it was a really, really fast CME. It was probably because this active region created multiple CMEs and the, the one that created in the Carrington event was a really fast one because the other ones had already cleaned up the space in between the sun and the earth. This is a newspaper from uh, New York City. And it says that the telegraph actually was useless. The internet of the Victorian times, the telegraph didn't work. If a big geomagnetic storm were to happen, our current internet would also suffer 
because of the uh, induced geomagnetic uh, storm effects on our internet and the system that we use to propagate the signals. How big was the Carrington sunspot? Uh, we are able to take the drawings by Richard Carrington and put it on the surface of the sun. And this is what I'm doing here. And it's not that big. We've seen bigger sunspots. This is a sunspot that was observed in 2003. Uh, and you know, in terms of size, it's similar to Carrington, even a little bigger. So it's not so much about the size of a spot. Uh, there are even bigger sunspots that either the Carrington and the one we have here, uh, it is about magnetic complexity. Of course, we don't have magnetic field measurements at the times of Carrington, only these drawings. But for this sunspot in here, we do have the magnetic maps against the polarities. Uh, and here you see that is a very complex magnetic region. There is the white, there is the black over here and the white. And as I've been telling you, it is when these white and blacks are close together that we are able to see huge magnetic explosions from this region. There are many such areas here in this map. Uh, but of course, this one is particularly complex, and it is this magnetic complexity that leads to big explosions. Uh, we don't have the magnetic fields at the times of Carrington, but in today's era, of course, we are able to use artificial intelligence, and some people are trying to get uh, what was the magnetic configuration during the Carrington event. Uh, of course, this is not observed. This is just using artificial intelligence, uh, using this type of data. And here, what you see is that, well, it was probably a very heavily magnetically complex region that created this current tournament. So I've been talking about this space weather effects. That's how we call it. The, the, the sun creates a space weather, the conditions, the space conditions in, the, uh, in all the uh, solar system. Uh, and of course, for us, it's important because it impacts our technological society. Uh, but actually, this space weather has also a role to play in modern astrophysics. We are looking for exoplanets, exoplanets that we're finding orbiting other stars. And oftentimes, we find exoplanets that are actually orbiting much more active stars than our sun. Our sun is not as particularly active. We know of many other stars that are a lot more active and where the uh, storms that they produce are thousands of times more energetic. Actually, and not that far from us, uh, Proxima Centauri is an M dwarf. And M dwarfs are known to have a lot of magnetic activity, much bigger than the sun. We found an exoplanet that is in the habitable zone near Proxima Centauri, it's called Proxima B. Uh, Proxima B is in the habitable zone, so probably there is water, but because all of, all of the magnetic activity uh, from Proxima Centauri is radioactive water. So the habitability conditions of Proxima B is not only the temperature and the ability of having water, it's also how it is impacted by all the radiation that is coming from the, from the parent star. And this is actually of relevance for many of the exoplanets that we're finding in the, in the galaxy. So this is why this physics is important and understanding how these magnetic connectivities are created is, is critical. I've shown already this type of maps before, but we were only observing the inner solar system. Here I have even, I have gone uh, to Jupiter. Jupiter is in here, and this is Saturn. And you see the spiral uh, that I've been talking about. This spiral is these open field lines that most of the time is just a spiral configuration, but then there is one of these magnetic storms that perturbs the spiral. Well, try to find out how is Saturn, that is in here, magnetically connected to the sun. You have to go through the spiral and go through all these loops over here until you get to the point of the solar surface that the magnetic field that is connected to Saturn did start. So from Saturn, it's gonna be very, very difficult. You have to resolve all these turns that the spiral is making. So the best way to get this connectivity and understand how it is produced is to get closer. Uh, Saturn is bad, even the earth is too far away. The Earth is impacted by multiple processes and understanding exactly how the spiral goes to the surface of the sun, oftentimes, if not always, is very difficult. Um, so really what we need to do to understand how these magnetic connectivities are created is getting closer to the sun. Getting closer to the sun and really looking at the sun in detail to see how the explosions are created. Well, that's what we're doing with this space missions and with the Daniel K. Inouye Solar Telescope. DICIS with four meters is gonna give us the details. It's gonna give us unprecedented details in everything that we see at the surface of the sun. And with these two space missions, 
This is the NASA Parker Solar Probe, and this is the European Space Agency Solar Orbiter. They are both getting closer to the sun. And as I said, by getting closer, you are able to understand better these this connectivity properties. Uh, and uh, both of those missions are actually measuring particles and fields. What is what I mean by particles and fields? That they measure in situ the plasma properties. They measure electrons, they measure protons, they measure magnetic fields locally where they are flying. These are consequences of what happens on the sun. We are looking at the sun with dickies, we're trying to understand the explosions, and then something happens in the heliosphere. Understanding this cause and effect, what we saw on the sun with the telescope uh, by detecting the electromagnetic images uh, from the, the photons from the sun and comparing with what particle solar probe and solar which are measuring in situ, we are creating what we call a multi-messenger problem that is helping us to understand how these magnetic connectivities are created. Uh, the multi-messenger comes from using particles, using fields in situ from particle solar probe and solar orbiter versus the images, the electromagnetic images that we detect by detecting the photons with Dickies. So this is a beautiful combination that is helping us to understand this connectivity. Uh, we are using different configurations of both the uh, space missions and the uh, telescope. Uh, this is sometimes confusing to understand. What I have here is the Earth that is fixed over here, and the Sun is also fixed at this point in here. Parker Solar Pro and Solar Orbiter are doing complex figures in this type of maps where both the Earth, the Earth, and the and the Sun are fixed. Uh, but what we can see here is that sometimes we have this beautiful configuration where with Dickies, we are able to observe the sun from one side. Solar Orbiter is on the other side of the sun, and we're also able to observe the sun with Solar Orbiter. And then Parker Solar Probe is in quadrature, measuring in situ the particles coming from the sun. This is a beautiful configuration for understanding this multi-messenger problem. Uh, and it is because of the properties of uh, both Parker Solar Probe, Solar Orbiter, and Dickies. With four meter telescope, we are actually able to see details on the surface of the sun. But not only that, Dickies can also see the solar corona. This outer part, I mentioned the sunspot was not a surface effect. It also had a 3D structure on the corona. With Dickies, for thanks to properties that I'll explain in a second, we're able to see the solar corona. So we can observe the atmosphere that is on this part of the sun with Dickies. And these are the particles that are going to be measured by Parker Solar Probe. And actually with Solar Orbiter, we can also observe with the telescope from Solar Orbiter, the corona in different spectral regions. And the whole combination is this multi-messenger problem that is helping us to understand how these connectivities are created. One thing that is important that I want to clarify is that Parker Solar Probe is really, really close to the sun, even though you see it here. Parker Solar Probe is reaching close to 10 solar radii. So it's really close to this yellow dot over here. Solar Orbiter is getting closer, but it never gets closer than 60 solar radii, and it hasn't been there yet. Parker has already been at 10 solar radii. So by having different proximities, we can really measure different types of processes. And if we are able to observe this with Tikis, we start trying to solve this uh, multi-messenger conundrum that tells us how the whole conditions of a space weather, how all the magnetic connectivity is starting from, from, the, from the Earth. Now, let me concentrate on Dickies and how Dickies can help in this multi-messenger problem. Here you have an image of the telescope on the island of uh, Maui, this, this island over here. Maui is the island that got these terrible fires and some of our people have been impacted. We're still recovering from this major disaster. Uh, the telescope was okay, was never impacted, uh, but some of our people actually lost their homes, and we are slowly recovering from this major disaster that occurred on the island of Maui. The other telescopes are on the island, on the on the big island. This is where Mauna Kea is. Uh, Dickies is actually here at the summit of the Haleakala uh, mountain, uh, and here you have an image of the telescope. The telescope actually started operating in 2021, and we've been getting data that I'll show some of, uh, some of this data in a second. But before I do that, there is a property of the telescope that I want to explain, uh, which can be seen in here. This is the light of the, from the sun that comes down, and then it goes at an angle 
to the secondary mirror. This is the primary mirror and the secondary mirror. Most of the time, the secondary mirror is right in front of the primary mirror and is uh, suspended with a spider. Uh, the spider and the secondary mirror create a diffraction pattern that you can recognize, for example, from James Webb Space Telescope. This is the diffraction pattern. So you're only observing this star, but you have this light over here uh, that is dispersed and is created by this spider and the secondary mirror that is typically in front of the primary. For Dickies, we're trying to avoid that. Why? Because, uh, well, if you want to see something that is not bright next to something that is bright, these diffraction patterns are going to be a problem. And the way to avoid that is by doing this off-axis configuration. Dickies has this secondary mirror on a side, so it doesn't impact the light before it hits the primary mirror, and it doesn't have all these strikes that you see in here. Why is this important? Well, precisely because we want to observe something very dim, very low intensity in terms of photons that is next to the sun, to the bright sun. We want to observe the solar corona. Uh, to observe the solar corona with Dickies, we have to have this off-axis, is how it's called configuration, so that we avoid all this straight light that will actually uh, make very difficult uh, the, our ability to observe the, the solar corona. This is why Dickies is a slightly different and has this off-axis configuration. This is the telescope itself. Then the light goes down to where the instruments are. Uh, all the detections of the solar light and the spectroscopy happens down in here. Uh, but the telescope itself is already with this off-axis configuration for allowing us to observe the solar corona. Here you have some images of Dickies already observing the sun, and you can tell he's observing the sun because how bright is some of the uh, other auxiliary mirrors that we use. Um, it is four meters. It is the largest solar telescope in the world. The second one is 2.6 meters. So Dickies is by far uh, the largest solar telescope. That allows us to get more photons, and that allows us to, to resolve smaller features over the solar surface. Dickies started operating in November 2021. This is the uh, time when we started the commissioning phase. We're still in commissioning phase, slowly trying to uh, bring all the subsistence uh, back online. Uh, here is the Kuder lab. This is down below uh, where we have all the instruments. Uh, the light from the sun, uh, from the telescope comes down from here. And this is where we have a clean room, a clean room to facilitate the observations, the careful observations of the sun with minimizing a straight light. Uh, and this is where we have a total of five instruments for observing the sun. What we're doing here is this spectroscopy, where this is where we're observing the magnetic fields on the sun. Um, and right now we have four of these instruments available. There is a fifth that needs to come relatively soon, early in 2023. This is an image uh, taken from Dickies, and I'm going to show you what are the capabilities of the telescope and why we think it's going to really change the way we understand uh, this magnetic fields at the solar surface. You'll recognize that these are two sunspots. Uh, this is a dark feature, uh, and less dark, this is what we call the umbra of a sunspot, and this is the penumbra. And here we have another sunspot. Actually, the two sunspots are touching each other. Here you have the umbra, another umbra, and the two penumbras that are in contact over this region in here. This configuration is what we call a shear configuration, uh, and they encounter over this line in here. This is a beautiful image, uh, but of course with Dickies, what we're trying to observe are the details. So what is important with the Dickies image is to actually expand and zoom it as much as you can to see the details. When you do that, uh, you're going to see why Dickies is probably going to help us understand how these explosions do occur. I don't have the magnetic fields here because at that time we only had uh, the BBI instrument, the instrument that took the image, but other telescopes uh, observed those, the same region here. And actually we know that this is of one polarity that will be one of the, you saw the magnetic, the magnetic field has always two poles. This is one of the polarities and this is another polarity, this is an opposite polarity. The two polarities are meeting over here. And if we zoom in here, this is the region where the two polarities are meeting and are encountering each other. And this is where the flares do occur. This is where all these explosions 
that I was showing with these filament interruptions that hit the earth can start when you have this type of what we call neutral lines. It's neutral because this is one polarity. Here is the other polarity. Over that line in here, the polarity is zero, is neutral, and that's why this is called a neutral line. Well, if you look carefully, you'll see this feature here. This is a tiny little feature that we found with Dickies. What is what this is? Well, this is kind of a spring configuration. You probably see that there is this brightening, darkening, brightening, darkening. The darkenings here are probably only 100 kilometers close to the diffraction limit of the telescope and demonstrating that we actually needed four meter, the four meter of Dickies to start resolving this configuration. So the whole area here is filled with magnetic fields. And the magnetic field here is in this spring-loaded configuration telling us that there is a lot of magnetic energy stored there. And as I explained, it was it is in this region, these neutral lines, where we get these flares, this coronal mass ejection. So probably what we are seeing in here for the first time is regions where the magnetic energy is being stored and ready to be freed into some form of flare. Once the flare has occurred, probably the energy that is creating this spring configuration will actually be able to be released and propagate into the outer space and perhaps hit the Earth and create auroras. So probably this is a trace of how things are occurring. I want to do go back to one of the things I was saying. This is the configuration of the sunspot observed by Carrington, the one that created the Carrington event, the biggest uh, solar storm that we have on record. Uh, what you have here, what is what you see? Well, this is an umbra, this is a penumbra, this is an umbra, and this is a penumbra. And the two penumbras are touching each other, exactly this type of configuration. So 163 years later, we're starting to see the magnetic configuration in detail and how is that the energy is probably stored in, in, in this small scale region and starting to figure out how they can free it in the form of big explosions, magnetic explosions, and then propagate and impact the Earth. So what we now need to do, this is an image. Uh, we don't have the magnetic field maps of, uh, of, this, of this region in here. These are the other instruments with Dickies, but slowly we're bringing this instrument online. And when we have the magnetic configuration, we'll be able to know how much energy is stored and how much energy is liberated in these flares and then understand better these, these space weather effects uh, and how are they created. It took 163 years, but I think we now have the sensitivities and the resolution for starting understanding these, these processes that can have a huge impact on the sun. Uh, on the sun and then on the entire solar system, including the Earth, of course. I'm now going into the last part of my talk. Uh, what I have here is an image from a total solar eclipse. Uh, this is 2019. So this is uh, in Chile. It was actually an observation from this. This photo was taken from the Cerro Tololo Observatory. Uh, what is what you see there? This is a total solar eclipse. And I saw at the beginning of your presentation that you've been into a number of solar eclipses. So you probably know as much as I do about solar eclipses. Of course, here the yellow high density ball of plasma that I was talking about at the beginning of my presentation is not seen because the moon is in front of, of this ball. It's in between us and the ball of high density uh, plasma, the yellow ball of the sun. What we see is actually the outer atmosphere of the sun, the solar corona. And I've been talking about the heliosphere, heliosphere reaching out uh, for about 100 astronomical units and then encountering the galaxy. Then there is the high density blob of plasma. Well, in between there is this connecting region that is the solar corona. This is where these connectivities occur. So we really need to start looking at the corona carefully. We've been able to do that for quite some time, mostly using satellites, satellites from NASA, from ESA, that when they observe in the ultraviolet, they observe the solar corona. But these satellites have not been able to measure the coronal magnetic field. And everything, all these magnetic connectivities are, of course, of magnetic origin. So we need to know what's happening with the magnetic field. Well, Dickies is particularly designed for observing the magnetic field of the sun in the solar corona, in these regions in here. And I'm going to enter into the details. If you have curiosity, you can ask how we measure the magnetic fields in the solar corona. But this is a specific property of Dickies that I think is going to transform. Uh, the way we understand these explosions and how these connectivities do occur. This 
uh, that you have in here uh, over Mexico and then over uh, the United States is the path of a total solar eclipse. That is gonna be a very unique opportunity. It's happening in 2024, in April 8th. We're gonna see this eclipse crossing all North America from Mexico to Canada. And this is the path here in the, in the United States. So if you have had an opportunity to see a total solar eclipse, you probably know how beautiful uh, the images of the solar corona are. Here you have another image uh, taken from, this is the 2017 total solar eclipse also uh, across the United States, actually in the opposite direction. And it's a beautiful uh, experience. Actually, I do recommend to go and see a total solar eclipse because really it's magic what is happening during these total solar eclipses. But now we have an opportunity to do science we were not able to do. During a total solar eclipse, scientists bring specific telescopes to measure the corona because it's really a unique opportunity. You can do easy spectroscopy of the solar corona. You can take easy images like these ones and actually measure densities. But now with DICIS, we can measure the magnetic field. So for the 2024 Transamerica total solar eclipse, uh, which will be in April 8th, coming from Mexico, entering from Texas, and then leaving from, from Canada, uh, what we're gonna do is to have experiments that are along the totality path, but then we're gonna be co-observing with DICIS at the same time. I wanna make clear one thing. DICIS does not need an eclipse to observe the solar corona because of the off-axis configuration and other properties of the telescope uh, that I haven't discussed. And if you have curiosity, I can, I can comment on it. Uh, DICIS can observe the solar corona even outside of solar eclipse. So even if it is in Hawaii, and the totality doesn't go uh, through Hawaii, we will be able to observe the solar corona. And then with this smaller and dedicated telescope, we'll get additional properties of the solar corona. And Parker Solar Probe happens to be in perfect quadrature at the time of the eclipse. By quadrature, I mean that Parker will be here. And this is not just that Parker will be on this side of the solar system. Parker, more or less in distance, will be at this distance because this is... 10 solar radii, you take the sun here, and this is one solar radii, you count all the way to 10. More or less, this is where Parker is gonna be. So we're measuring with a spectroscopy, the spectroscopy from Dickies, the properties of the corona here. We're also measuring densities through the total eclipse path here in the United States, in continental US. We're measuring the magnetic fields with Dickies because Dickies can measure the magnetic field. And we can understand really the physics of the corona over here and then measure what are the consequences in the in the Parker Solar Prof is measuring in situ. This is a beautiful multi-messenger uh, example that we're gonna be doing in April 8th. And it's all like gonna give us a beautiful opportunity to see how the sun actually creates and controls the heliosphere and these magnetic connectivities that can have an impact on Earth. This is what we will be doing with, with DICIS, with Parker Solar Pro, but this is an opportunity for amateurs. Actually, a bunch of institutions here in Boulder are organizing 40 sites along the path to measure the uh, totality, to make images of the totality with a relatively small telescope. You can see the, how big it is, it's a small telescope, but of course, totality is so unique that even this type of small telescopes are very competitive. I'm gonna have 40 telescopes along the path and we're gonna have amateurs and high schools taking our pictures of the totality while we're observing with Dickies and while we are measuring the in-situ consequences with Parker Solar Pro and Solar Orbiter. So we hope that this is gonna give us a unique data set uh, that will tell us how the sun is actually creating the corona, the heliosphere and the magnetic connectivities that are important for our space weather conditions, but even for other stars and other planets to understand how they are magnetically connected to the stars. I think that's all. And the, the background here is a Dickies image that I still admire. And that's everything that I wanted to say. Thank you all. Thank you so much, uh, Doctor. That was a great uh, Lecture, uh, thank you so much. You presented it so much in a very clear uh, manner, even for us laymen. And the, the pictures are so nice. Yes. Let me know. Go, go now to the uh, Q and A. 
let me see. So there were some questions here uh, that were given. Mm -hmm. uh, the first question was actually have something to do with the uh, with the uh, with the Dick is uh, measuring the uh, doing observations on the Corana, and I think uh, you answered that already. Uh, 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 let me follow that up with a question. I have always wondered why they they said that the solar corona is uh, the temperature is much hotter than the surface. Have mm -hmm. there been any explanation why this is so? Well, uh, yes and no. I mean, the problem of coronal heating is precisely why we are uh, building dickies in a way that it can measure the magnetic field. We know is this of magnetic origin. It is the magnetic field that is releasing energy in this outer part of the solar atmosphere and is heating the solar corona to million degrees. Uh, let me, I mean, I'm gonna... Uh, so some of the images of the solar corona, I was saying, okay, well, there is a sunspot at the surface, but in the corona, it's really bright. It's bright because it's uh, very hot and it is emitting at, with plasma, that it it's at million degrees of temperatures. How does it get this million degrees? We know it's of magnetic origin, uh, but whether we have more waves propagating and dissipating or reconnection, what I was talking about of these uh, different polarities that meet together and every time they meet and they reconnect, they dissipate energy is unclear. Probably both are occurring on the sun and probably we have waves dissipating energy and probably we have magnetic reconnection happening. The big CMEs, uh, these CMEs that eject the filaments we know that there is reconnection and we've measured, actually with Dick is one of the results that we're publishing is that we've measured electric fields. And if we measure electric fields is because there is reconnection happening there. This is one of the most important discoveries that we've done with one year of Dickey's data. So <clears throat> basically the answer is uh, the problem of coronal heating is why we're building Dickey's, is why we have missions getting closer to the sun for sure that the heating of the corona is behind why there is a solar wind, why the corona is expanding, uh, because it's at million degrees and a million degrees plasma cannot be static, it has to expand. Uh, so this is the biggest problem uh, that uh, we have in stellar astrophysics, in solar physics. Um, we know it's of magnetic origin, but that's where we're really concentrating uh, all the efforts on understanding how this process occur. And this ability of Dickies to observe the corona and measure the magnetic field is really unique. Thank you, doctor. Uh, I, I remember uh, you were mentioning the Carrington event. And I remember when I was starting with the uh, solar imaging uh, more than 10 years ago. And I mentioned to a friend, can I see a white flare? And he said, oh, if you see a white flare, be very afraid. <laughs> so yeah. I'm, uh, I'm, uh, I'm kind of, uh, there's a question here. Uh, about related to that, do we need to worry about uh, super flares or like the Carrington event? And uh, I think you mentioned, uh, explained a little yeah. bit on this already about the impact on, on Earth uh, if if, they, if it does happen. And uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, so so are we making any preparations regarding this event? Uh, I mean, if if all our communication systems go down, the internet goes down, or even the satellites, the GPS satellites, uh, uh, suddenly stop functioning, uh, what will be the impact here on Earth? Yeah. yeah. Let me answer. I think there are two aspects of the question. One is uh, about the white light flare. Uh, is this yeah. a problem? Of course, a white light flare means that there is a lot of energy involved on the flare. Uh, the flare occurs more in the corona and is this magnetic configuration that reconnects and then particles go down and when they hit the surface, you see the white light flare. But you have to have a lot of energy on those particles. So the fact that we see a white light flare is telling us there is a lot of energy involved. But as I said in my talk, energy is one of the aspects. The other aspect is it has to be directed towards the Earth. You see, if it is on the other side and it misses, like the one I showed, this one, this coronal mass radiation that was a uh, black color measured by a stereo that missed the earth and didn't hit us. So it has to be very energetic. It has to be directed towards the earth. If additional coronal mass ejections have occurred before that have cleared out the space, the next one is gonna be much faster. 
and much faster means more kinetic energy. And if in addition to that, it comes anti-parallel, then is when the big fireworks occur. If has a white light flare, is very fast. It, other CMEs have occurred before and it's really, really fast, but the configuration is parallel. The magnetic field of the air is here and the magnetic field of the CME is also parallel. Then there is not much of an effect. There is a still some effect, but not as big. So it's the combination of things that have to occur for having the big Carrington type of event or even bigger. There can be even bigger than Carrington and there are some geological uh, data that tells us that there were bigger flares from, from, uh, from the sun. Then uh, are we doing something to prepare for those conditions? Yes. Now the problem is that well, building dickies is part of what we're doing, trying to understand how it's all created. Because we now know that the energy is stored in these small configurations. And we need to understand how the energy is stored and how the energy is released to really understand the physics of the process. So our predictive capabilities are not good. They are not good yet. We really cannot predict when the big flares are gonna happen, uh, the magnitude of the flare, uh, and the impact on planet Earth. So there is a lot of research that needs to occur. We're calling it space weather, and we want the space weather to be one day similar to what we have with uh, predicting weather on planet Earth. But really, we are a century behind. There is a lot of research that needs to occur. In the meantime, what we're doing is, well, uh, hoping for the best. Uh, we are monitoring uh, the sun and we have this network i did show data from the full disk of the sun where with le less sensitivity where with uh, less resolution we monitor all the magnetic fields at the solar surface 24 7. and that tells us something uh, and we can prepare for oops, uh, we can prepare for we can be prepared for uh, some of the flares but the big ones there is nothing we can do all we can do is perhaps switch off some satellites so they don't get uh, a big impact from the big flares. We can uh, stop planes from going from the through the poles because this is a particularly bad region when the flares do occur and when the CMEs hit the Earth. You don't want to be uh, having a polar route. Uh, and this is all we can do. If a big Carrington or even bigger event were to occur now, we will have trillions of dollars of losses we will have without electric power for some time, probably some people are talking about months where we'll need to recover the ability to have power uh, at our homes. Uh, and the consequences are, as I said, trillions of dollars. Now, there are institutions that are trying to be prepared for this type of events here in the US, NOAA, uh, they do have the, here in Boulder, the Space Weather Prediction Center, that are trying to do the best work in terms of how to predict these consequences. But a CME, as I said, take a day two to arrive to the Earth. We have very little time since we see the flare. We know the CME is coming uh, and we are not able to predict whether it's coming parallel or anti-parallel uh, to the magnetic field of the Earth. So still, we have a lot of research to do. Uh, we're trying our best, but uh, the consequences are, as I said, you know, important, mostly because of our technological society. And let me say one more thing. Uh, we are now, NASA is now trying to go back to the moon. Oh. The astronauts are going to be in the surface of the moon. Actually, the astronauts of the Apollo mission were very lucky. No big flares did occur. Uh, actually, there was a huge flare that occurred in between two Apollo missions. I think it was between 16 and 17. There was a huge flare that would have impacted them if they would have been on the surface of the of the moon. So now, uh, as part of the Artemis program, NASA is trying to improve their predictive capabilities because we now know better what the consequences are of these space weather conditions. So there is a lot of research, uh, but we are really, we always say we are a century behind what the weather on Earth predictions are. We are still lagging behind and we are not able to predict the big flares yet. But that's why we need Dickies and that's why we need other space missions. Doctor, speaking of astronauts, would a Carrington event endanger the lives of the people and the space station? Oh, well, yes, if they're doing a spacewalk, they would absolutely get 
enormous amounts of radiation. And uh, the idea is as soon as we see one of these flares or that even uh, the NOAA SWIFT, this uh, Space Weather Prediction Center, sees that there is a magnetic configuration. I've been talking about magnetic complexity and they are able to say, okay, well, I think this region over here can produce a flare. Uh, they give a warning and in some cases, the space walks in the International Space Station, uh, they are uh, they are stopped. Uh, the astronauts are called to go inside, or they are actually uh, canceled, and the space walks don't happen. Uh, so yes, the space weather is now integrated into all the activities that the astronauts do in the International Space Station. Thank you, Doctor. Uh, and I remember regarding the Apollo mission, uh, the the uh, the Manila Observatory, I believe, uh, got uh, solar telescopes just for that to help observe <laughs> solar oh, yeah. affairs for for the for the Apollo mission. <laughs> That's yeah, why that's uh, we, we got uh, some support from NASA in terms of uh, solar telescopes. And there's yeah. a question here uh, uh, about uh, the solar constant, uh, Dr. Pilet. Is the solar constant really constant? It, is the sun dimming light slightly? Well, that's a good question. I haven't talked much about it. Uh, so, of course, there are all these fluctuations due to sunspots and then flares. Uh, but actually, if you integrate all the wavelengths, all the colors, the sun is pretty constant. And actually, what happens is that during solar minimum, it's actually brighter than during solar, so, sorry, during solar minimum is darker than during solar maximum. And that was not expected because during solar maximum, you have sunspots. And you would say, well, then the sun is on average darker. But actually, during solar maximum, the sun is slightly brighter because the magnetic fields are not only in the dark sunspot. The magnetic fields are also in the in other type of regions that are brighter. So on average, during maximum, the sun is slightly brighter than what it is during solar minimum. But it's only a tenth of a percent. So it's a minor amount. So the sun is pretty constant. Uh, and it, it doesn't change much in terms of the amount of energy that it sends to planet Earth. So actually... The sun cannot explain climate change because it's relatively constant. Something like a mounder minimum could have an impact, but we're not in a mounder minimum. Uh, and even a mounder minimum would not be able to explain any of the big changes that we're seeing here on planet Earth. Uh, so yes, the sun, the integrated sun, the amount of radiation we receive from the sun is actually pretty constant with minor changes due to the solar cycle, but only at the level of a tenth of a percent. Thank you. Uh, I'll read now some of the questions in the Q&A uh, from uh, Mr. Usman Ahmad. Just like we have made magnetographs using AI, so can we do the same to understand these small magnetic field phenomena on the sun? Or phenomena well, on the sun? Yeah, yeah that's With a good AI. question. Uh, oh, so, uh, Sorry, are we talking about artificial intelligence? Is the question about yeah. artificial? Oh, okay. Uh, using oh, yeah. AI to understand the small magnetic yes. field phenomena. On the you surface. know, we're going to use artificial intelligence for everything, right? That's what humanity is going to do in the near future, applying artificial intelligence in almost all aspects. Are we applying artificial intelligence in solar physics? Well, I showed some image of the using artificial intelligence and knowing the drawing of the Carrington sunspot. We now have a magnetogram from artificial intelligence, right? Uh, we cannot test how good the magnetogram is, uh, but of course, uh, it's good that the artificial intelligence is telling us, well, it was a very complex magnetic configuration and level of complexity is of interest. Uh, we're gonna use artificial intelligence, but I really want to explain where are we actually using in a practical way AI in solar physics. I've shown an image of a magnetogram from Gong. And I said, well, here we see the entire sun. With Dick is the field of view is small, but I showed the Gong image with the, and I said, this is how the magnetic field looks today. So these are the magnetic fields on the part of the sun that is facing towards the earth. There is another part of the sun that we don't see, which is the far side, right? So the sun is, uh, round, of course, and it has one part that we see and one part that we miss. We have one half of the sun that we don't see. Actually, through techniques called, and I haven't talked about it, 
helioseismology, via helioseismology, we can sense that there is a sunspot on the far side. A sunspot on the far side uh, will actually slow down the waves that we detect on the sun, and we can see these slow waves and say, okay, there is a sunspot on the far side, but we don't know anything about the polarity and the configuration of the polarities. So what we're doing is actually getting the far side maps that doesn't have any information about positive or negative uh, polarities, and actually starting to say, okay, the polarities are going to be distributed in this manner using artificial intelligence. That's really proving very, very useful in terms of having the full view of the sun. What is what we need to really do good predictions of space weather? We need to have the view from the Earth, but we actually need to have views from 90 degrees, and we need to see the far side. In the absence of satellites that are observing the far side of the sun, and there are proposals to NASA and to ESA to observe the far side of the sun, what we're doing is using this helioseismology and artificial intelligence to assign magnetograms. Because as I said in my talk, it's all about these polarities, whether the polarities are parallel or anti-parallel. And with helioseismology, all we know is that there is a magnetic field. We don't know the polarities. And via artificial intelligence, we can start saying something about the, the, what the polarities are on the far side. And this is actual, an actual active research area where people, scientists at the NSO, at my institution, are spending quite some time in getting these far side maps and applying artificial intelligence for getting a magnetogram from the far side. Eventually, the best would be to have an SDO on the far side of the sun. Thank you, Dr. Rob. Thank you for the answer. So I have two questions here uh, from uh, Mr. Dante de Jesus. And I think the first question is kind of been answered already, but I'm gonna read it. Can you say explosions in the sun is due to attraction property between magnetic fields and sunspots? Yes, so it is this configuration where magnetic fields change suddenly directions. This is where you get large electric currents uh, and this is where the explosions occur. So as I've shown in these maps, in these maps of polarities, where we always look is at places where there is black and white, because black and white is exactly opposite. And that would be where explosions can occur. Now, I don't want to say that when you only see white, there are no explosions, because you see white, but still the magnetic fields can have an angle with each other. And even there, you can have these processes that actually release energy. But the big ones are always in these complex magnetic configuration with opposite polarities touching each other. Thank you. And another question from Mr. Dante de Jesus, I guess this is for when you are doing, for example, H-alpha imaging. Can you call yeah. filaments as half levitated magnetic matter or particles? Correct. The so filaments, the, what are they? Yeah, yeah. Filaments, and I've shown images of filaments, not in H-alpha. These were in the ultraviolet. Uh, ultraviolet, uh, yeah. But, yeah, but you see there the, the filaments as well. but they are seen in H alpha, that is absolutely correct. This is where they were first detected. This is plasma that is suspended and is not falling down into the surface of the sun because the magnetic field is wrapping around into what we call a flatrock configuration and is able to sustain the matter there. You've seen this movie where uh, the mass was really not falling and it was uh, at a distance from the surface. This is the magnetic field is pushing the, magnet, the, the plasma there and is sustaining the plasma. And this is a, a stable configuration that for reasons we don't understand quite yet, but it's really important that we do, uh, it becomes unstable. And it is then when there is the coronal mass ejection that propagates in the, in the interplanetary system. Thank you. Uh, a question from Mr. Jonathan Galamay. What are the main challenges faced by the DKIS in terms of its operations and maintenance? Oh, Aside question. from the fire, of course. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, sure, no. Uh, <laughs> Uh, this is a great question because, look, when I started astronomy, <clears throat> I was actually on the Canary Islands, uh, and there we had a four-meter telescope, the William Herschel telescope, that was still active and is observing galaxies. Four meters to observe a galaxy. We're now talking about four meters to observe the sun. So the problem is completely different. What is the biggest problem we face? The thermal problem. Dickies is the telescope in the world that has spent the largest amount of effort in controlling the heat, the heat that is 
concentrated. Uh, I think I did mention, if not, I'll do it now. I mentioned that the prime focus were concentrating 13 kilowatts of solar light. So we do have actually another building next to the building of the telescope where we have thermal subsistence for cooling down the secondary, the prime focus, the secondary and all these area, because there is a lot of heat there. There's an um, immense amount of heat. I mean, we actually have seen how we can burn iron if we put it at prime focus of tickets. Uh, so the biggest challenge, uh, something that is new, something that no other telescope on, has ever faced is the thermal issue of a four meter telescope. Then there are other challenges, but I would say in terms of comparing with other existing ground-based telescopes, the thermal problem is by far the biggest uh, challenge that is completely brand new. Uh, in relation to that, uh, uh, I was about to ask this as well regarding the solar probes. And this is again from Mr. Usman Ahmad. Mm -hmm. How is, are the solar probe missions protected from all of these severe solar effects? Oh, it has a yeah. shield yeah. Uh, that is seen in the images that I was uh, showing. It, 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 is, it has a shield that protects Parker Solar Probe and Solar Orbiter. Actually, the materials that are used uh, for some of these shields, and they are different for Parker than for Solar Orbiter, um, these are materials that have been tested against radiation in nuclear plants, uh, because that's what they are facing, really high levels of radiation, high levels of even radioactivity. So uh, they do have a shield that protect the spacecraft. And actually only a few components of the spacecraft come out of the shield to detect the particles. Uh, but Parker Solar Probe is so close that it doesn't have any telescope looking directly at the sun. Solar Orbiter in the shield of the spacecraft has openings that actually has telescopes, but solar orbiter only gets to 60 solar radii. Uh, it doesn't get as close as 10 solar radii, which is what Parker does. So both the spacecrafts are protected with shields, with very specific technologies uh, that had to be developed for the mission. So that, that's enough to keep it uh, operational? I mean, it, and it will be, it will stay so, that way. Yeah, I mean, well, even so far, the high temperatures, yeah. Well, actually, Behind the shield for both Parker Solar Probe and Solar Orbiter, you have very cold temperatures uh, because mm -hmm. what they see is the dark universe uh, and they don't get any direct solar radiation. So behind the spacecraft shield, the temperatures are low. Uh, and that's how you protect the spacecraft. Now, um, is it working? It's working. Uh, it has worked beautifully. I think for the nominal missions of both Parker Solar Probe and Solar Orbiter, it's clear that these shields are going to protect the, both the spacecrafts. I think the question is more, all, this, all the missions that NASA and ESA sent, they have the nominal mission and then the extended mission. Is over the extended mission or for how long are we going to be able to actually operate those facilities past this nominal mission is unclear because of the problems of being that close to the to the sun. Parker Solar Probe actually is only one year to go. Uh, the last encounter will be in 2024. Sometime in 2024 will the nominal mission ends. And the question is, well, at that time, uh, how is the spacecraft doing? How is the shield of the spacecraft doing? And for how long can we continue operate the mission? But for the nominal missions, the shields are working beautifully. Can, can you uh, expound a little or just uh, say a little about the how what uh, we have learned so far from the from the Parker solar probe mission? Yes. Uh, and actually, you know, I uh, had a slide. Uh, I had a slide that I was considering showing, uh, but I thought it was too specific. Uh, but Parker solar probe is really, really close to the sun, right? 10 solar radii. So this is We've never been that close. It will take some time for to, to go back there. So we've seen things that we were not expecting. What is what we've seen? And you know, I showed these magnetic field lines, the ones I was calling open magnetic field lines, right? So they had these red lines, the open field lines, and the closed field lines that were more the closed field lines associated to sunspot. I'm more talking about the open field lines where the solar wind is emanating. So these open field lines. We always thought it was a magnetic field line, so something that just is straight. 
Uh, actually, what Parker has seen is that relative, as you get closer to the sun, they are measuring what they call switchbacks. The switchbacks are that the magnetic field from the sun are going out. All of a sudden, they turn on itself and then they go back. So they do like an S configuration. I don't know if you can see my, my finger. So they yeah, are going up, then going down, and then going up. So there is an S shape on almost all the magnetic field lines that Parker is encountering. What are these switchbacks? Uh, it is unclear, uh, but one of the answers is that the way the solar wind is started at the surface is again via magnetic reconnection of opposite polarities. And if opposite polarities meet together, you can create down in the corona this S that then propagates upwards. This is actually an area where Dickies can help. If we are able to find the foot points of some of these magnetic field lines and understand that there is this reconnection happening, that would help understand these magnetic switchbacks. Why are they important, the magnetic switchbacks? Uh, it's a long story, uh, but one of the things we don't understand is how the sun actually is decelerating. Uh, the, how the sun is losing angular momentum, which is a property fundamental from, from, from physics and how the sun was created, is not well understood. So there are processes by which the sun is losing angular momentum, and actually all the stars, uh, that are not correctly understood. And perhaps the generation of these switchbacks is part of the explanation of how the sun is losing angular momentum much faster than what we think. So there are important implications about these switchbacks that only when you are close enough to the sun, we see them. We, we were not able, we, we saw a few switchbacks at one astronomical unit, but really we didn't know they were so prevalent when uh, you get closer and closer to the sun. Parker Solar Probe is measuring every time it gets relatively close to the sun. Again, as I said, 20, between 10 and 20 solar radii. My, the switchbacks are everywhere. And that was really unexpected. Thank you. Uh, there's a follow-up question regarding the filament from Mr. Dante de Jesus. Uh, you mentioned that this, this, this is the effect of the magnetic field. Uh, and uh, his question is, is there an effect of the sun's gravity in this filament? Oh yeah, uh, so it's a balance between the magnetic tension that is pushing up versus the gravity pushing down. And then the question is who wins? Uh, for while the structure is stable, the magnetic field lines are uh, pushing up because they are concave upwards, it's a flat rope. And then the mass is on the, uh, on the bottom part that is pointing up. And he's able with magnetic tension, that's the force, is able to uh, keep all this mass from falling down uh, because of the gravity. And that can be a, a configuration that is stable for months. But then for reasons that we don't know, it becomes unstable, it's no longer able to stay the way it was, and it develops these instabilities that lead to the final flare and the coronal mass ejection. Uh, then there are a lot of other forces that are at play. Uh, but during a lot of the lifetime of the filaments is a balance between gravity and the magnetic tensions. And they are both the same. And you have all this solar matter that is suspended and is not falling and is stable there for, for in some cases, months. Thank you, sir. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, it's getting late, uh, but I think those are all the questions from the from the attendees. Uh, maybe I can ask our panelists if they have uh, questions for Dr. Pilet. Uh, yeah, I have one uh, for Dr. Pilet. Uh, uh, doctor, I read before that the solar wind is slowing down. Is, is that true? And what is uh, the impact of the solar wind slowing down? Well. Uh, so we do have fast solar wind and a slow solar wind, and they come from different regions on the, on, on the sun. So the fast solar wind comes from these magnetic field lines that we call open field lines. When I was showing the red field lines, 
This is where the fast solar wind comes out. Uh, we don't know what is accelerating the fast solar wind. Uh, there are hypotheses, and perhaps it's better understood than this slow solar wind, uh, but it's not entirely clear. So this fast solar wind uh, is always fast, and by the same amount of speed, it's always about 500 kilometers per second, 700, somewhere there. So the fast solar wind is always there, and we haven't detected that it's slowing down. Then there is the slow solar wind, but the slow solar wind is not, it's much more difficult to observe. Uh, it occurs, it's patchy, it occurs in some regions. Uh, and probably what you have seen is of a specific cases where the slow solar wind was really slow and that can happen. But below 500 kilometers per second, we call it a slow solar wind. And there is a spectrum of velocities uh, that it really can occur depending on the magnetic configuration. Is there anything systematic that is telling us that the slow solar wind is getting slower and slower and slower? No, we haven't seen that. Uh, we haven't seen that. But uh, the slow solar wind, the origins of the slow solar wind is really not well understood. Uh, there are a number of theories, uh, but because it's less prevalent, less, much harder to measure, uh, we have the theories are not as developed as for the fast solar wind. The one that I was talking about, uh, this one with the magnetic switchbacks from Parker Solar Pro, this is the solar wind that is emanating from there or through these switchbacks. Uh, and this corresponds to the fast solar wind. These are the switchbacks that are observed in open field lines that correspond to the fast solar wind. The slow solar wind, the origins are unclear. And probably what you've seen is that in some cases it was really slow, but probably is because of whatever specific magnetic configuration was associated with that part of the slow solar wind. We don't understand it very well, the slow solar wind, much less than the fast solar wind. Thank you. Uh, doctor, the yeah. fast solar wind, are those coming directly out of coronal holes? Yes, that is correct. I haven't mentioned coronal holes in some of my images. There were coronal holes. What are coronal holes? Is where these red field lines, there was a time when I had the sunspot with the yellow field lines, field lines that were closing on each other, much closer to the solar surface. And then the ones that were red that were opening. Coronal holes will be on those open field lines. It will be a unipolar area. And this is where the fast solar wind comes out. And this is where most of the switchbacks that we see are coming out from these coronal holes is actually from the boundaries of the coronal hole that we see the association with switchbacks. Okay, and we see more of these coronal holes as we go to solar maximum, is that correct? Well, what happens at solar minimum is that the coronal holes are very stable. They are at the poles. Ah. Uh, and then during solar maximum, they actually are can be everywhere uh, and actually can be at the equator. We see more uh, and they are more dynamic and they are moving and evolving a lot more than during solar minimum. In solar minimum, they are very stable and the polar coronal holes are at the poles. Uh, and actually, it is then when the, from the poles, you create the entire Parker spiral, this is spiral I was showing, uh, and that's how you create the more or less stable heliosphere. Because during solar minimum, there are no coronal mass ejection and all you get is the field lines from the poles. At that time, the sun is almost always magnetically connected to field lines that are coming from the poles. So yes. Great. Thank you so much, Doctor. Thank you, Doctor. Uh, a few, uh, just a few more questions. <laughs> Sorry. Sure, no uh, problem. This is this is about sunspots. Uh, uh, yeah. The first question is: Why do sunspots appear at higher latitudes at the start of a new sunspot cycle? And then it oh, well, goes, I mean, near the equator, right? Yeah, right. So that's a question from someone that knows a lot about solar physics. I haven't mentioned that, but it's true. Sunspot early in the solar cycle appear at higher latitudes, and then they come down to uh, lower latitudes. Now, why is that? If I were to say that we understand this 100%, I would be saying we understand solar dynamo 100% and we don't. Uh, so we don't have a clear answer. Why are they starting? at higher latitudes and coming down. What we know, and I've indicated something about it, is that it's all related to the large scale flows on the sun. 
there are two flows that are important. One is rotation and the differential rotation. So the equator rotates faster than the poles. Something that, by the way, we don't understand. Why, why does it happen? Why the equator is much faster than the poles? So there is this differential rotation. And then on top of that, there is something called meridional circulation that we've measured. So both large scale flows are real. The meridional circulation is plasma that from the equator goes to the pole, dies down, and then inside the sun returns back down. So the meridional circulation is thought to be responsible for bringing down the sunspot at the cycle evolves. Somehow they start at the top, uh, and the reason is not entirely clear. Uh, and then the meridional circulation will bring these magnetic field lines that are created at the beginning of the solar cycle down and down and down through the meridional uh, through the meridional flow. The meridional flow is very, very slow. We're talking about meters per second. Uh, so it's, it's a very, very uh, slow flow. Um, and it takes 11 years to actually go through the entire process. Uh, and But we've measured, uh, it, it is 100 meters per second, but it's very, very slow compared to other, uh, other flows that we measure. And it's probably the meridional flow that is bringing the sunspot down to the equator, but really it's not entirely clear. If I were to say we understand that 100%, it would be equivalent to say we understand solar dynamo 100% and we don't. Yeah. Thank you, Doctor. Uh, the, the other question about sunspots is this. Uh, the sunspots usually have similar magnetic polarities in a cycle. Why are there a few sunspots that seem to have an opposite polarity? Also, why does the polarity of sunspots reverse with solar cycles? Well, these are good questions, all of them related to the solar dynamo. So yes, most of the time we have what we call uh, the Hale polarity law, which is positive polarity is the leading polarity and negative uh, polarity is the following polarity. That's for one cycle. Next cycle will be the opposite. Uh, and we understand why it has to flip, uh, but exactly why the uh, positive polarity and negative that happens for most of sample sometimes is the opposite. Sometimes you, we do see the opposite to the hail orientation. So what I'm saying is normally in the, uh, it's complicated in the Northern hemisphere because it's different in the Southern, it's exactly the opposite. In the Northern hemisphere, the, po the positive polarity is the first one, is the leading polarity uh, uh, following the solar rotation and positive is before and then following is negative. Sometimes you have a elective region that is exactly the opposite. It has negative uh, in the leading part and positive in the, in the, in the following part. We don't know why they do happen, uh, but one option is that they are created deep in the sun, and this is a loop that emerges. So once it emerges, you have here up the positive and here the negative. If during the emergence, they do this and they flip around, through additional flows on the sun, then you'll see the opposite orientation. So that's the idea that during the emergence of the sunspot from below, there are flows on the sun that are able to turn the whole flux system by 180 degrees. That's probably some convective motions that are doing that. Uh, and there are simulations about that, but we don't know for sure why we have anti-hail orientations in some, of the, in, in, in some of the active regions that we see. That was one part of the question. Uh, then the other is about flipping the polarity from one cycle to, cycle to the next. That we understand a little better uh, because we know that how you do it is you start with, let's say at the North Pole, you have a positive polarity. Then during the solar cycle, we know that this positive polarity is gonna be canceled by negative polarities from the active regions that are emerged here, we see negative polarities that are moved from the meridional flow to the poles and canceling that one. So that process that reverses the polarity from one cycle to the other, at least we know one 
culprit. We know that there is the meridional flow bringing this opposite polarity to the poles and reversing the, the polar magnetic fields. Now, exactly what happens in terms of is the magnetic field being submerged? What type of cancellation occurs? That's why we need DICIS. Actually, I think this is one of the scientific, scientific targets of DICIS to observe this cancellation with the best resolution and with the best sensitivities. But at least we know that these meridional flows are playing a role because we see the opposite polar polarities during the solar cycle, how they approach and cancel the pre-existing polarities at the poles and reverse the, the, the polarities. I'm talking about a lot about polarities. I hope you are following me. <laughs> uh, yeah, but, doctor, I, I was actually about to ask from a layman's point of view because yeah. you, you show the magnet uh, with the North and the South Pole. So actually the terminology is positive or negative as far as the sun is concerned, not North or South. Yes, I mean, all this explanation of the magnetic fields are better mm -hmm. done with cartoons. And so, so for this reversal of the polarity of the sun from one cycle to the next, I'm sure you can put it in Google and you'll find what I'm <laughs> saying about uh, some polarities being taken by the meridional circulation to the poles and canceling and reversing the polarity. This is something we actually see, uh, this yeah. reversal of the polarities, because it happens at the surface. It is less clear what happens in the interior. Thank you, doctor. And the last question is about comets and the effect of the sun. So the question is, some comet tails go through a disconnection event. What is going on with the comet's tail as it interacts with the sun's atmosphere and magnetic field? Oh, that's uh, an interesting question because, you know, let me say one thing that I haven't said, which is many of what I said is something that we've learned about the sun during my career. So when I started as a solar astronomer, we didn't know how important it was this thing that the magnetic fields were parallel or anti-parallel when they were coming towards the earth. So this, these are things that I've seen becoming more and more important. So it's knowledge that we have acquired in the last 35 years. One of the things that we've learned is how many comets hit the sun. And that's SOHO with the SOHO uh, mission, which is an ESA mission. We've detected a lot of comets uh, that actually fall into the into the sun and get destroyed by the sun, of course. Uh, we've seen uh, with stereo uh, how a CME can hit a comet and take the tail of the comet. Uh, so there is a beautiful image that uh, the CME hits the comet and the tail of the comet goes with the CME and the comet loses the tail. Um, We've seen how comets, and this is with AIA, as they get closer and closer to the sun, actually they get, uh, they actually, this, they are ice, so they evaporate, uh, and you see how the evaporation occurs. So, but what I think is important is that the inner solar system is very active in terms of attracting comets and destroying them and doing all kinds of things with them. Uh, there is, this is something that was really, really important early in the solar system when it was originally created. There was a lot of that happening at many distances uh, in, the, in the solar system. Now it's occurring much closer to the sun and it's not as dangerous to us as it was early on. But there is a still a lot of comets in the inner uh, solar system that we see how they go into the sun and get destroyed. And sometimes they just lose the, 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 the the, ter the tail, uh, sometimes they get completely dissolved. Uh, and that's something that has been created over these 30 years since we launched SOHO. It's been SOHO and Stereo that have they've done a lot of comet studies. Uh, I actually don't know much about comet studies with uh, Parker Solar Probe and Solar Orbiter, but I'm sure there will be. Thank you so much, Doctor. I think there are no more questions uh, from our panelists. Uh... Thank you so much for your patience. I, I think I learned oh. a lot. Wow. Well, <laughs> I know that uh, no, no, there was so much. That I want to say is that all the questions were good questions. You have knowledgeable <laughs> people there. Very clearly, they are knowledgeable people. Uh, and I've seen that at the beginning, you have had a lot of uh, experiences with eclipses. 
hopefully we'll see us uh, in one of the eclipses that Thank are you, coming. We are looking we are looking forward to the 2024. I hope we can yep. visit there and view it yes. with you. I'll Thank let you, you know. so much. <laughs> and uh, before we end, Doctor, again, uh, uh, in answering all the questions, and kindly allow me to present our hello uh, ALP certificate uh, of appreciation for your talk. Thank you so much. Uh, and uh, this, uh, I, I would like to read it. Uh, uh, this certificate from the Astronomical League of the Philippines reads as follows. This certificate is presented to Dr. Valentin Martinez Pilet for his invaluable insights, experiences, and expertise shared with the participants of the online talk entitled New Windows to the Sun, held as part of the ALP Astronomy Expert Speaker Series of 2023 given the 17th day of September, 2023, signed by Mr. James Kevin T. President and yours truly, Dr. Jose Francisco Aguilar, Vice President. And before we go, Doctor, may we have a group picture with you? Oh, please. Uh, uh, James, uh, can you do the honors? You're on mute, uh, James. Uh, sorry. Ready? One, two, three. Uh, wait. One, two, three. One more. One, two, three. Thank you. Again, thank you so much, Doctor. No, uh, thank, thank you, you Doctor Valentin, for <laughs> a very great information on the sun. Yeah, no, uh, great questions. You do have people that really know astronomy uh, a lot. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I was not expecting having to talk about switchbacks and all of these. Great questions. I, yeah. I've had a lot of fun. Thank you so much. For Thank, your you. Time. Thank you so much, Dr. Valentin. Oh, nice. Appreciate it. Yep. Uh, Thank you very much right. for sharing all of your expertise. My pleasure. Sure. Anytime. Bye. A lot. <laughs> So before we conclude uh, today's webinar, I would like to thank all of our attendees for joining us. We will be sending your certificate of attendance for today's webinar by email to all registrants who were able to join us today. As mentioned earlier, this is the 20th uh, online talk in our ALP Astronomer Experts speaker series since we started last year. Our first speaker was the late Dr. Jay Pasakoff uh, on April 23, 2022. Our other speakers since then were Mr. Zolt Levi, Mr. Joe Rayo, Mr. Fred Espenak, Mr. Robert Reeves, Mr. Ken Crawford, Mr. Dave Eicher, Professor Matthew Barlow, Mr. Scott Roberts, Father Christopher Corbali, Mr. David Levy, Mr. J. Kelly Beatty, of course, Imelda Joson and Edwin Aguirre, Dr. Daniel Green, Dr. Heidi Hamel, Dr. Delbra Amel Green, Brother Robert Mackey, Brother Guy Gonsolmano, and our very own uh, uh, Miss Hilary Andales, and of course for today, Dr. Valentin Pilet. We are so grateful to all our webinar speakers who were very generously gave their precious time to share their knowledge and expertise to the world amateur astronomical community. We can never thank you enough. Thank you so much. And for those who missed all our previous ALP Astronomy Expert Speaker Series talks, you can view the video recordings of our past webinars at, our, at, at your convenience at our official ALP YouTube channel shown here. So just visit the ALP YouTube channel and you can view all our past online talks. And for the next online talk for our ALP Astronomy Expert Speaker Series, uh, uh, we, have, we still have to uh, come up with the date uh, uh, and the time, but uh, uh, these are uh, our two speakers, uh, future speakers, uh, Dr. Mike Brown, who is a planetary scientist at uh, California Institute of Technology. He might talk to us. I mean, he might talk to us about Pluto, and uh, Dr. Meg uh, Yuri, who is an astrophysicist at Yale University and an expert on extragalactic astronomy, and she might uh, give a talk on black holes. So uh, thank you, uh, and we will be making the announcements. Uh, in our social media page and at our webpage that astroleaguefields.org regarding these talks. So uh, please kindly wait for the announcements. 
And again, thank you everyone for attending. Take care everyone and uh, clear skies always. For our panelists, I will be sending a link for our post-webinar Zoom meeting. Thank you everyone. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Okay. Bye, -bye. Bye. Bye. Bye.